Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we'll be talking about the histological changes that are occurring within the lungs in COVID-19 infected patients. A couple of disclaimers before we start. The first is that this is very early on in the disease process and so we don't have a lot of data available to us and certainly over the next few months and years we'll get a much better idea of what the histopathological changes in the lungs are and what they mean for the disease process itself. The numbers of patients in each of these studies that I'll describe are very small. And the studies themselves are limited in the way in which they were done, especially with the lack of immunohistochemistry that was available and the correlation with all of the phenotypic data for those patients. But in the midst of a pandemic, this is the best that we have. And I've trawled through all of the data that I could find and all the papers that have been published on Medline, Web Science and so on. And so things will change more stuff will be published and i'll try and update um, with new videos as things get more well established the other proviso is i'm not a histopathologist although i've got a uh, background in having done research with immunohistochemistry and histopathology i am not a pathologist i am not an immunohistochemist i am very much going by what is published in the papers that i present the other thing that's really important is that almost all of the papers that I will present have not yet been fully peer-reviewed. They haven't actually been fully published yet, and they've just been released early. So the data, again, take it with a pinch of salt, but they do seem to show some interesting trends, and that's what I want to try and present in this video here. The first study uh, published in the Journal of Thoracic Oncology, or will be published, is really interesting. This is a study where we were able to get lung samples and assess them from a histochemistry perspective before the patients actually became symptomatic. We just so happened to have the lung um, samples because they came for resections of tumours as elective patients. So this gives us a really interesting insight into patients before they become symptomatic and early on in their, um, in their COVID disease state. This particular study only looked at two patients. They both came for elective resection of lungs and this lung tumours and they were both adenocarcinomas. Although it doesn't specifically say it in the um, papers, I suspect these patients didn't get any new adjuvant chemotherapy, nor did they get any new adjuvant radiotherapy, just given the uh, way in which the resection was done and the timings. It's worth putting into context that about 80% of patients who develop coronavirus get mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. So it's entirely within the realms of possibility that patients could be coming for major lung surgery undergoing major lung surgery and then being discharged, as you'll see from the second patient, and for them to have had ongoing coronaviral infection during that time. We don't know why some people seem to be getting really bad infections and dying, and others are not. But it's not, these cases are not very unrealistic cases to present. The first patient is an 84-year-old female who came for an elective resection of a 1.5 centimetre right middle lobe tumour. And what they found in terms of background is she was hypertensive and type 2 diabetic. This is very common of a lot of patients who end up with severe coronavirus. But to be honest, most patients over the age of 60 probably are at a higher risk of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. They did an initial CT scan to diagnose the tumour, and that's what I'll show in the next slide. And what they found was some ground glass opacification at the same time. So what I want you to do is look at plate A to begin with. And you see here, this is the tumour. And so this is the thing that was resected during surgery. But I want to draw your attention to the contralateral lung. And what you can see here is some areas of ground glass shadowing. And this ground glass shadowing, the surgeons and the radiologists put down to just some post-inflammatory changes. But subpleural ground glass shadowing is actually very commonly seen in patients with coronavirus. 
The reason they call it ground glass, it's basically the radiographic appearance on a CT scan. If you look up at the top here, this is what normal lung looks like. It's black. There's not a lot of fluid in the interstitium, and so you, and there's not a lot of cells around. However, um, when the f when the interceptal regions fill up with edema and cellular exudates and inflammation, it can give this so-called ground glass appearance. And ground glass is essentially uh, where it comes from is looking through frosted glass and it would look a little bit like this and that's what they are trying to describe. So this is initially on diagnosis of the tumour. You can see here in plate B, this is a CT scan that was done 13 days after the first scan. And you can see there's proliferation of this ground glass shadowing which is predominantly subpleural. This is looking a bit further down at the base of the lungs. But you can see there's certain, certainly progression of that inflammatory condition, which later was diagnosed as being COVID. So in terms of the time course for this patient, if they were diagnosed at day one and the CT was classed as being day one, they had their thoracoscopy and lobectomy done on day 12. Day 13, so the day after the surgery, they did a repeat CT scan, which showed progressive ground glass shadowing. However, the patient was completely asymptomatic and remained so for another four days. So it was only on day 16 after the initial CT scan did the patient start to develop a wheeze, cough and some difficulty in breathing and requiring supplemental oxygen. Now, this is the first key point that I want to um, point, point out, really. And that is, this patient had symptoms only 16 days after the initial CT scans showing evidence of inflammation. Now one could argue could that initial inflammation have been something else or could it have been lymphangitis from this uh, cancer? Now the honest answer is we won't know for certain however it's likely that this was early coronaviral infection and as you'll see from the histology later it probably was. So these patients are symptom are not getting symptomatic for weeks after their initial infection. Now this particular patient deteriorated and by day 12 had a massive jump in white cells which we know now is usually a bad prognostic indicator of the patient's clinical condition when dealing with coronavirus. The saturations continue to drop over the next few days. The patient, the family, and the treating surgeons felt that the patient was not appropriate for intensive care, was um, left at uh, ward-based treatment only, and then died at um, day 29. The second thing that I think is really interesting to point out is that this patient never had a fever. And we are certainly seeing a certain group of patients who are get developing severe coronaviral infections who are not having fevers. Now, she may have been on regular paracetamol, because of pain from her lobectomy. However, even so, even with an antipyretic, um, the fact that she didn't show a fever is important to show that not every patient has to have a fever with coronavirus, and certainly those that deteriorate with coronavirus. So this is the really interesting thing, where we look at the actual histology of the underlying condition. What you can see here, in um, the first plate is that there's a lot of proteinaceous stuff. This is an exudate that seems to be uh, coming out into the alveolar space and you can see that here in the light pink. These are all H&E stains. And so this proteinaceous exudate with granules seems to be filling up the alveolar and may explain some of the hypoxia that we're seeing later as that becomes more prolific and more widespread. And here, this is an alveolar space, and you can see this big splodge of pink here is a large um, protein globules that are just um, being impacted into the alveoli themselves. Now, what's really interesting is there seems to be fibrin deposition in these patients as well. So if you look at this alveolus, there's a huge ball of fibrous tissue that you're seeing here with a number of small cells, these 
dark purple dots that you're seeing, these are all nuclei. So these are mononucleated and multinucleated giant cells that we're seeing. So a lot of inflammatory infiltrates moving into the lung tissue itself. And that's what's causing a lot of this inflammation and damage. What's interesting in plate D, this one here, is you can see here, there are these small little vacuoles that are filled with some um, genetic material, and these we suspect are probably viral inclusions. So overall, what you're seeing is a lot of proteinaceous exudate, a lot of inflammation, and a lot of fibrin deposition. Now, if we think about the second case here, which is a male, 73-year-old, who had a background of hypertension coming in for a right lower leg resection and node clearance, again for adenocarcinoma. They had a they had a slightly different time course. Day one was classed as the day they came into hospital and had their surgery for resection of their tumour, which was diagnosed at another hospital. Day two, they'd done a CT scan, and this showed evidence of some ground glass shadowing. The really interesting thing is this patient recovered really well, so much so that by day six after the surgery, they were discharged from hospital, feeling absolutely fine. So again, we're seeing this asymptomatic period. Then, at day nine after the initial surgery, the patient suddenly starts to develop fever, dry cough, and myalgia. They represent a hospital where they're admitted. Now, they are swab positive for COVID at this point and are treated with supplemental oxygen and just um, expectant management. Never need to go to intensive care. And by day 31, they are discharged from hospital, having fully recovered. So we see here that there's two very different clinical courses between this patient and the last patient that we described. And again, it's really important to bear in mind there is this significant asymptomatic period before the patient actually presents to hospital. And I think that's important because what we're seeing here is that the patients that are coming in that are symptomatic with their COVID infection have probably had at least a couple of weeks, if not more, of progressive inflammatory exudate, proteinaceous exudate, fibrin deposition, and just general damage to the lungs before we've even got to see the patient. So we are already starting on the back foot. The histology of these patients seem very similar to that of the first. Again, we're seeing this proteinaceous um, exudate filling up the alveoli. We're seeing thickening of the interceptal lines with a lot of inflammatory exudate. And these type 2 pneumocytes seem to be becoming hyperplastic, probably related to the inflama inflammatory milieu that's around there. They describe these so-called fibroblast balls in the interstitium, these things here that you can see with lots of fibrin deposition and a few nucleated cells there as well and lots of macrophage infiltration and type 2 pneumocytes that are again being hyperplastic. Unfortunately, the drawback to this particular study is that there was a lack of immunohistochemistry, partly because they were retrospectively looking at this, but it would have been fantastic if they could have stained specifically for the virus to see A, where the virus is and how it seems to be distributed. But it's really interesting that early on in disease, this is before they are becoming symptomatic, they are having evidence histologically of damage to the lungs and inflammation of the lungs. Interestingly, again, there is no mention of microthrombi in the pulmonary vasculature. And certainly that's something that people did talk about as um, COVID may be causing a hypercoagulable state and causing microvascular thrombi. Now, there was some vascular congestion that was noted on this um, histology, but they weren't able to actually detect, or at least they didn't report any thrombi. The prominent histological feature seemed to be that of alveolar wall edema, lots of proteinaceous exudate, and this is very similar to what they saw with SARS and with MERS previously. There's inflammatory clusters and this fibrinoid proliferation with plugs in the alveoli. 
Interestingly, what was absent was this neutrophil infiltration. We think that's probably quite intuitive because there isn't a bacterial form to this, but certainly um, neutrophil infiltration does not seem to be a prominent feature in this um, disease process, at least initially. In terms of comparing it to patients with SARS, there was a lack of hyaline membrane formation and a loss of and less squamous metaplasia. Now, the slight caveat to that is we're looking very early on at disease before patients are even symptomatic. A lot of the SARS data that we have are based on cadaveric work. And so later I'll be talking about some of the um, cadaveric work that's been done in COVID-19. Uh, and um, certainly again there, they didn't really see much in the way of hyaline membrane formation. One of the main uh, limitations of this study was the lack of immunohistochemistry. There is a um, Lancet paper, again I'll talk a little bit about later in this, uh, in this video, where we look at the immunohistochemistry and it's really interesting to see the um, distribution of the viral um, proteins in terms of whether it's alveolar, vascular or anywhere else in the lungs. So this is a really interesting study that they looked at histopathologic stain, uh, changes with immunostaining. So the real thing that they didn't have in the last study, which was the immunostaining, to see where this viral protein is found, whether it's in the vessel, whether it's in the alveolus or somewhere else within the lung. So again, this is just a letter that was published. Um, and they did just one patient. This is a case report of a male who's 72, again with type 2 diabetes and hypertension, who presented with fever, cough, and became swab positive by day 6. They were intubated and ventilated after 7 days of presentation to hospital. They um, did the CT scans, and you can see here just diffuse ground glass shadowing and some areas of focal consolidation that are starting to develop as well. And you can see it a little easier here on the non-lung window, in the mediastinal window here. And this is roughly where, um, from the cadaveric studies, they tried to take the biopsies. Um, this patient died, and so they were able to take these post-mortem needle biopsies. Um, it was a very limited uh, post-mortem, partly because they were in the middle of a pandemic, and so they just weren't able to do full autopsies, partly from an infection control perspective as well. But the histopathology is quite interesting. Again, we're seeing diffuse alveolar destruction, organising, and that's what we were seeing there in that mnemonic bit that they were taking the biopsy from. The alveolar lining cells were just being denuded, they were just sloughing off. And there was this interesting type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia that was happening. I suspect probably secondary to the inflammatory milieu that's around. Now, there's a lot of intra-alveolar fibrinous and chronic inflammatory infiltrates. And we suspect that's probably where this sort of consolidation type picture is starting to come in. And these intra-alveolar fibrin plugs. And again, that might be causing consolidation, collapse, and lack of aeration of certain areas of lung, and certainly the hepatization of lung that we see to this. Now, if you look at the immunohistochemistry, this is what's really interesting in patients. Because what you're starting to see here is a variety of different things. The first is just a normal um, light microscope. And then what they've done here is they've immu used immunohistochemistry to tag any viral proteins. So everything that you're seeing here in red is viral protein. What you're seeing here in black are actually blood vessels. So by overlaying the two, you can see where the viral envelope proteins are. And you can see that in a lot of the alveolar cells and in the alveolar epithelial cells. But if you look at these black lines, the blood vessels themselves, there's very little expression there. So what that tends to suggest is that these patients are probably getting um, 
deposition of the alveolar protein in these areas, but not in the vessel walls themselves. So the vascular edema that we're seeing, whether that's actually secondary and not directly affected by the virus itself, not sure, but this tends to indicate that actually the virus is affecting more of the alveolus than it is the blood vessel itself. Another really interesting study, and this again hasn't been peer-reviewed, it has just been um, published before print, in preprints, is um, this study, which is looking at the pathological um, status of patients who have had post-mortem biopsies. They looked at four patients, three males and one female. They all had chronic conditions. One had immunosuppression, one had cirrhosis, and they all had hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Their onset of death was between 15 and 52 days. So quite a wide spectrum there of disease severity, but they all did die. What they found was that multiple organs were affected. We'll go through this in later uh, videos, but one of the binding sites, one of the primary binding sites for coronavirus is the ACE2 receptor. And what we are finding is that it's probably related to um, that binding site and it's affecting multiple different cells in different organs that express that ACE2 receptor. Really interestingly, they did take biopsies of cardiac muscle and they did not find cardiac myocyte infiltrates. The reason I say that's really important is because we were seeing a subset of groups with a myocarditis. Now, it just may be that the patients who died here in the four patients that they did didn't have that. But it might be that certain patients have a certain proclivity to developing myocarditis, maybe due to expression of other receptors that are similar to ACE2 that most patients do not have. But it's just interesting to note. And finally, the Lancet um, study, which again was a just a letter, just a small letter really that was published. There again not huge amounts of detail, but it just described one particular case, a 50-year-old who um, was admitted with fever chills, who had travelled to Wuhan 9 to 13 days before presentation. So again, we're looking at patients who have been exposed to this virus, had a quiescent period of up to a w two weeks before they present with any symptoms. This particular patient um, refused intubation, their initial chest x-ray showed patchy shadowing, which got worse on repeat imaging. And he lost for 14 days on 60% high flow oxygen because he refused intubation. And on that last day deteriorated and then had a sudden cardiac arrest. And the reason I want to show this is I just want to, you to cast your mind back to those initial histological pictures that we were seeing of early COVID disease. And we are seeing almost exactly the same things again. Diffuse alveolar damage, this fibromyxoid exudates, that proteinaceous exudate. Here, late in disease, we are seeing hyaline membranes. Now, if you remember the early study, they didn't see that. And we were saying that with SARS, they did have it. Well, I suspect it's probably more to do with the fact that this is much later on in the disease course, where there's time for those hyaline membranes to form and for a true odds type picture to prevent. The other thing that's really interesting to notice, the pneumocytes themselves are very atypical. We talked about type 2 pneumocyte hyper, hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Well, it does seem that they have viral cytopathic cells, so they look like they've been affected by the virus. But interestingly, at least in this histology, they weren't able to find intranuclear or intracytoplasmic viral inclusions. What does that mean? Well, it might mean that actually the virus has stopped replicating and what's happening now is a secondary inflammatory response. It's difficult to say, and again, we're too early on, and the paper itself doesn't really discuss this in any more detail. But what is interesting to notice that late in disease, and this is a patient who had terminal disease, who was late on in their disease, it does seem to mimic that of MERS and SARS, which one would expect given that they're similar viral diseases.
So the final thing that's worth thinking about is other considerations. There's a lot of talk about these patients having a hypercoagulable state and having pulmonary microthrombi in addition to large segmental uh, pulmonary emboli. Now, this is thought to be due to being hypercoagulable, but certainly in these early histological cadaveric studies, they have not found, or at least not commented, on seeing pulmonary emboli or evidence of pulmonary infarction. The other thing that's really interesting, and I will be producing a video on this, is the direct effect of the virus on haemoglobin. We are seeing this funny phenotype of patients, the so-called happy hypoxics, who are just sitting there with saturations of 60, 70, 80% and not feeling breathless, feeling absolutely fine, and in fact even being able to talk in full sentences. And there is a question as to whether this is actually whether the disease itself is actually affecting the midbrain and those respiratory centers that give people that sense of feeling short of breath. And certainly there's been no histological data on this. And in terms of other organs, the Lancet paper and others have shown some evidence of um, other organs being infiltrated by inflammatory cells very similar to that of the lungs. However, it doesn't seem to be every organ. And again, much more work needs to be done to look at this because certainly some of the patients are developing multi-organ failure, such as acute kidney injury. Whether that's relating to our management of the patients with high PP, uh, with high PEEP strategies or with trying to um, volume or fluid them or whether actually they're developing microthrombi if they're in a hypercoagulable state and causing uh, essentially a DIC type multi-organ failure. It's really difficult to say. And to be honest, the conclusion from all of this is there does seem to be early inflammatory changes that are occurring in the lungs before any symptoms. These can precede symptoms by up to two weeks or probably more. These patients have what look to be quite destructive lung disease and so whatever the underlying pathologies are there is destruction there and so it will take a while for these patients to improve and so don't be surprised if these intensive care patients take weeks or even months to improve back to something like baseline. And possibly other organs could be affected as well. As I say, I'll be producing a video on the effect of coronavirus on haemoglobin and um, I'll be trying to produce that soon. So if you do want to see that, um, subscribe to my channel and hit the bell notification and that way you'll be told as soon as that video comes up. Thank you very much.